this is based on ideas that have been floating around for a long time. So th these are not brand new ideas. Uh, the idea of transfer from our first language to our second language and transfer for things, things we learn in our second language that actually influence our first language uh, by uh, multi-directional or bi-directional transfer. Uh, lots of things that people are talking about a lot in the last 10 years. Uh, Multi-competence. I'm going to be talking about is the idea that when we learn other languages, we don't have a separate place in our brain for each language. They actually overlap. There's no real border between it. So it fits the uh, theme for this conference. Uh, Multi-competence is what I, uh, we have been working with. Um, everyone knows SLA, right? Second language acquisition, foreign language acquisition, but bilingual foreign language acquisition, which Ortega and a lot of people these days are talking about, is the idea that being bilingual or multilingual is not a deficit. It's something, it's an advantage. And the idea that monolingual speaker or writer norms are not the, maybe the best model all the time for people communicating across cultures. And um, Translanguaging is a relatively new uh, idea of uh, Kana Garage and others are talking about using, taking advantage of using what we really do all the time, using all the languages we know. Like when we write, we don't just write, if we're writing in our second language, we don't just use the second language while we're writing. All the research that shows that we do rely on the other languages we know at the same time. So to say you have to think in English only when you're writing in English is um, maybe unrealistic. Um, so we talk now about L2 users more than L2 learners or students. And uh, the whole notion of identity is very important. And of course, English and as an international language, English as a uh, lingua franca are very important topics these days. And, related to what I'm talking about today. So my aims today are first to introduce what I just said about uh, monolingual norms not being maybe the best target that intercultural speakers or multi-competent speakers is a better target for us to uh, our role model. And I want to show some new directions in my own research and focus on the main focus, which is advantages for multilingual writers, bilingual or multilingual writers. Um, today I'm using multilingual to mean that you're able to use more than one language, not that you're a balanced bilingual or a multilingual in every language. So how many people here can write something in more than one language? Maybe send an email or something. Okay, everybody in this room is a multilingual writer. That's what I expected, yeah. So that's what I'm talking about. Even without being very proficient in writing in every language, you still are able to do it. And the reason you can write in other languages that you don't know so well, part of the reason is because of what you know about writing in your, in your first or second language. And a lot of times we learned more, at least my students have learned more in their second language about writing because in, Jap in Japan, anyway, Japanese writing is not taught, academic writing is not taught as a separate topic, and I think that's true in Korea as well. Okay, so when I was here before, I talked about contrastive rhetoric. It's still an interesting, I'm still very interested in contrastive rhetoric, um, but in fact, uh, the idea that Japanese is organized, for example, traditionally from more specific to general, inductive organization and the classical rhetorical structure ki sho ten ketsu in Japanese which came from Chinese and it's also in Korean as a traditional way of organizing ideas and 30 years ago we were looking at the fact that a lot of times when our students were writing in English they were kind of using this ki sho ten ketsu kind of stru uh, structure and the problem that would come up was with the ten where they'd go to a new topic uh, or twist. So the coherence in English didn't look so good. And we were comparing that to the way, of course, English uh, is being taught, in, certainly in North America, uh, to write a composition in a deductive way from the main point and then show the specific support, introduction, body, conclusion, this kind of way of, of uh, writing. 
And I think this was a very useful approach and a way to help our students write better English. But in fact, it, it's uh, outdated in the sense that we now know that it's much more fluid. Rhetorical structures are much more fluid. And in fact, in Japan now, the way students are trained to write a good essay in Japanese to enter the university. Many of the better universities require that they write a Japanese essay. And they're taught to organize that essay very similarly to the way English is, is organized. So they're supposed to put their point first and then explain it. So uh, basically, rhetorical structures are very flexible. They're dynamic. They're changing. Also, writer agency is important. Writers uh, can change, and they can, they can be innovative, and that's what I want to show today a little bit of. So more recent approaches, as I mentioned, multi-competence, uh, and then intercultural rhetoric rather than contrastive rhetoric emphasizes that people negotiate and accommodate each other um, from diverse backgrounds. And then writer agency is important, and then the translingual practices that I mentioned. OK, let's get now to the meat of the thing. I'd like to share some research that we've done with four uh, writers who were writing in three languages each. So they, the same writer was writing an essay in Japanese, in English, and then in a third language. Uh, so I'll show you what they were. So definitions in this study, L1 is what it's always been, the language that you first learn to read and write in. But in our study, we defined L2 instead of, we originally defined it chronologically, the second language you learn. But in fact, that didn't work out very well for what was going on with our writers. So we, just, we changed the definition. We decided that L2 in our study was the language that they felt most proficient, they were most proficient in writing at the time of the study. So L2 is the second language in their, in their mind for writing. And then, so in our study, for two of the students it was English, for one of the students it was French, and for the other student it was Korean. Okay, so for them it was easier to write in Korean or French than English at that point. I'll explain why in a minute. And then the L3 is the the foreign language with the lower proficiency in, in this study. So let me introduce the four participants. First was Sakura. These are not their real names, but this is what we call them. And they helped us choose them too. Sakura was a third year undergraduate, and she had spent one year as in high school in England and then come back to Japan, and then she spent another year as a university student uh, in the US. Uh, her English was quite advanced. She was almost a balanced bilingual because she really worked to keep her English up. She kept interacting with uh, foreign students and uh, communicating with people that she knew overseas and so on. Her French, however, was not very good. She had only studied it uh, for a couple years at the university. She'd never been to France, so she was really a lower intermediate French speaker. Uh, Chie is the second student, and she actually had spent three years in high school in um, Ireland before she came back to Japan, and she was actually a first year graduate student. She studied Spanish as her second foreign language at the university, and she spent one year in Spain studying. So her English had, she hadn't really kept it up as much as Sakura did, so it was good, but maybe lower advanced, and her Spanish was intermediate level. Then Kenji was a fourth year undergraduate, and he had just returned from one year in France. So he was still thinking in French, he was really immersed in French, and uh, even though his English was at a pretty good level, it really wasn't much different from the French, but it had kind of a little bit of attrition in terms of using it because he was, his, the French was coming, and I understand that. Uh, and then Ryoko was the last one. She also was a third year undergraduate, and she had come back recently from spending two months studying in Korea. And her English and Korean were both intermediate level, but again, like Kenji, she felt much more comfortable with her Korean at that point. And she perceived that Japanese and Korean have a lot in common in terms of 
grammatical structure and concepts and so on. So that was part of the reason too, besides the recency factor. Okay, so we had the students write, or the participants write in um, on four topics. So the first two topics, teach, should we teach foreign language in elementary school? Unfortunately in Japan, this is still quite a controversial topic, unlike Korea. So I don't think this topic would work well in Korea because I know people have been teaching it for a long time. But in Japan, it's much more controversial. And in North America too, where we also collected data um, in the past, it, it's also controversial. And then should elderly people live with family or not? That was this other topic. And we had used these two topics with large groups of people in the past. So we decided to use the same topics here, but we needed a third topic, which was requiring university students to, who are majoring in a foreign language to spend one year overseas studying. So that's what we added. Unfortunately, the recording, inevitably, <laughs> the recording went bad with one of them because we also did a think aloud, which I'll explain in a minute. So we had to add a fourth topic, which was similar uh, for one of them. That is, should university students have to teach it, uh, to uh, study a second foreign language or not? Um, we added the think aloud. Has anybody here done a think aloud protocol? A lot of work, right? It's so much work. Oh, I would never do it again. But anyway, it, if you do it, <laughs> it's fascinating because you can try to get a, a much better picture of what people are thinking while they're writing. So what you do with a think aloud is you ask them to verbalize what they're thinking in whatever language they're using. It doesn't matter. It comes out quite mixed, actually. And you record it. And then you transcribe it. And then we had to go back with them and listen to it with the, each participant looking at the uh, paper to, to really figure out what was going on. But it was, it was a really interesting, um, I'm glad we did it. As I said, I wouldn't do it again, but <laughs> it was amazing. And then we had usual questionnaire and, and in-depth interviews afterwards too. So it was pretty time consuming. Uh, our data analysis, uh, we, I won't tell you all about it, but we focused a lot on um, t the text features of the argumentation, how they organize their argument. And the justification is the basic pattern that all the textbooks teach and we teach of having the position and the reasons, maybe a counter argument and refutation and then a conclusion, that kind of pattern. Exploration is a different kind of pattern. There were two exploration patterns, more of an inductive way of exploring the topic and then coming out with something at the end, which maybe is more common in our Japanese students' writing. And then a second kind, which I'll show you uh, in a little while which is similar. And we also looked at meta discourse, um, hedges and boosters in particular. Hedges are softeners like may and it seems and possibly, and boosters are uh, emphatic markers, very greatest, all and so on. We also looked at the participants' own uh, perceptions of their writing, so their emic view. Okay, for the composing process, the think aloud part, we had to analyze the data and we divided into, this is the usual way to divide it into three stages of writing. Before you write is the pre-writing stage, the planning stage. Some uh, writers will make notes or have an outline or something at the beginning. And then the second stage is the actual writing of the, and we had them do it by hand, by the way. <laughs> Uh, this was a few years ago. Uh, maybe they would have <laughs> objected, but anyway, we did it that way. And then the revising stage, once they finished the draft, they would go back and reread it and make changes and so on. But the more important part was that we categorized each of the activities that they used while they were um, writing. So planning, um, meta comments, or just making comments about things, rehearsing, translating, and so on. I'll show you a couple of definitions of, of those in a minute. For every activity, then we looked at what language they used. Did they use just their first language? Did they use just the target language? Or did they mix in the same activity while they were planning? Did they mix the languages? And there was a lot of mixed language, and I'll show you some examples. So these are definitions of three of the main activities. So planning is generating ideas, content, or structure. 
uh, organization at either a global level, which means the whole essay level, or between paragraphs, or even within a paragraph organizing the paragraph, because local level was basically the w within a sentence. So w were they planning just the sentence? Or were they planning more? Uh, rehearsing is after planning, usually. They are actually saying what they're going to write, rehearsing it almost the way it's going to be worded. And then word searching, looking for words. This is something we always have to do when we're writing in any language. Let's get the right word here. And then repair, we defined as after they'd already written something, they went back and erased it and changed it or added something. Anyway, we'll show some examples in a minute. So let's get, this is the main point, the four advantages for multilingual writers that we found. And the first advantage is the most important one. And it kind of underlies the second and third advantages. Um, they're all interrelated, actually. So the main advantage is their expanded core of shared knowledge, regardless of which language they're going to write in. They have some knowledge they can use across languages. Um, the second is the ability to reshape the knowledge that they have in new contexts across languages or in the same language. Also, number three is a greater awareness of reader, different reader expectations across languages. And the last one is they can use different languages strategically while they're writing as, as a tool. OK, here we go. First example. This, <laughs> this is exactly what I knew was going to happen if we did, went from my Macintosh to this. But anyway, <laughs> the position should be done. At least I made them different colors, didn't I? OK. Both Ryoko and Chie uh, used a basic argumentation structure, justification, uh, and applied it in their L2 and L3 essays. So the basic structure is position and supporting reasons, then a separate paragraph with counterargument and refutation, and a conclusion. I'm sorry, the, sorry this slide doesn't look as good as it should, but anyway. This is a, a schematic view of her two, um, her two um, compositions, her essays in English and Korean. So you can see that she first started with the position for studying abroad. She gave three supporting reasons. Then she gave a counterargument, the opposite side, not studying abroad, and refuted it basically using her supporting reason too. So this is a common kind of pattern. And she did something very similar in Korean, although she only had two reasons. And uh, then she gave her counter argument and the, the refutation supported both reasons. So for Ryoko, she actually learned this structure in Japanese debate class and in university. And uh, she had written also many reports in Japanese. She had little Korean or English experience with writing. Uh, her perception was that opinion writing is the same in any language. It's logical, it should have objective evidence, and it's not personal. That was her perception. And so she basically applied her, what she'd learned in Japanese um, to her Korean and English writing. However, she didn't use the same structure for Japanese. And one of the reasons, probably the main reason, it was a really sensitive topic about living, elderly living with the family. A lot of our writers had trouble coming out against that, for example, seeming hard-hearted or something. Anyway, so she, she chose to, to explore the topic more, both sides. She used an exploration, and then she came out with something at the end. Her composing processes were also uh, the same across all three languages. She was an advanced planner. She had a, a schema, or an outline, before she started writing in the pre-writing stage. And then she built up her text unit by unit. So hopefully this is going to show this uh, in a minute. This graph shows how many activities Ryoko, Ryoko's are on the right. So Sakura, Chie, Kenji, and then the blue is the, her uh, Japanese essay, the red is her Korean essay, and the green is her English essay. So you can see she used way more composing activities for per T-unit. A T-unit is like a sentence 
Um, it's a little bit more uh, complicated definition. You can ask me later if you haven't heard of TV units. I think most of you have. Anyway, we, we numbered how many activities per T unit, and she had the most in all three languages. Let me show you why. This is an example of her building up her sentences unit by unit. So she rehearsed in Japanese and then translated it into English. So she started with because, because we, uh, kitari, mitari, uh, listen and, and look, we hear and see. Uh, sono gaikoku go, sono this foreign language, uh, this. So she, little by little, as she was writing, this is how she, she built it up. So she was gradually building up text. And this is, seemed to be her individual composing style, because she even did this more in Japanese than the other writers. The other writers tended to write more fluently, longer pieces. Um, so she also had lower language proficiency and less writing experiences in her L2 and L3 than the other, uh, the other writers. And she may have transferred this strategy from oral production because there have been studies of intermediate speakers that show that this is a typical uh, strategy of building up little by little as you're speaking uh, uh, units, bigger and bigger units. As I said, she set up a cognitive map before, like a frame, and then filled it in. And this is a good strategy, especially for intermediate level um, writers. Uh, here, I'd like to talk another, this is the last example of advantage one. And this is Chie's had interrelated text features and composing processes. So she used hedges frequently in Japanese and in English. And she used repair frequently in all three languages. And let's look at this in a little more detail. Interestingly, Chie was in our earlier study, four years earlier, she was a returnee student because she had come back from Ireland. So she had written on similar topics or maybe the same two topics four years earlier. So we're able to compare her earlier compositions with her essays at four years later in this study. So at the top here we have how many boosters versus hedges that she used. Remember, boosters are things like very or extremely, and hedges are maybe, possibly, uh, softeners. So we can see that at the first stage, she only had two um, hedges in her Japanese essay, and she had 16 at the later stage. Remember, she's a graduate student now. And her English, similarly, she had four and then she had 11. So it was more balanced between hedging and, and boosters. Um, so this actually, we think, or she, we interpret what she told us that this came from her L1 academic training, that uh, she learned to be cautious in her Japanese writing uh, from reading articles and from having her own writing corrected by her supervisor. Oh, you need to make this. Uh, softer, you need to accommodate Japanese audience uh, not to be confronted by too direct a statement. And then her hedges in English were probably affected by her L1 academic experience too. Of course, she was reading in English, and there is a lot of hedging in English um, writing too. Uh, so her frequent repair. This was really interesting. This shows, this is a little difficult to follow, but uh, we'll try here. This shows five activities that she used, Chie used, to compose one sentence of her English paper. Let's see, let me get my, I think I have my pointer here. Um, her English composition, and the sentence she was composing is right up here, if I can get the right. This is a new tool for me. There we go. There's the sentence up there. Firstly, from two years ago, I started to live with my grandmother when my grandfather passed away. That's the sentence she wrote, in, uh, that she eventually wrote. But she started by writing the first sentence up here. Firstly, at moment, I live with my grandmother. Very simple. She wrote that fluently. Then she stopped, and she repaired. She said, Started to live, Nishoka, shall I add started to live? So then she did in the third one. She added started to live with my grandmother when at moment. That's not it. 
first from, from two years ago, so she added more information. And then she reread what she had and she, as a springboard, and then her final, uh, she added the, the part, the, le the rest of it, so she got this rather complex sentence and that's how she repaired it. And this is, this is typical of her um, process. So her use of repair at the micro level, meaning at the sentence and phrase level, again, my slide is messed up, I knew it would be, <laughs> originally came from her English training in Ireland, where there was the teachers emphasized grammatical accuracy. So she was very careful about um, accuracy. And that evolved into concern about rhetorical refining, making the word, word choice better, making the refining rather than correcting errors, making it, uh, it's not wrong, but it needs to be better by adding more information. In her English writing, most of her repair was to make the writing more formal, like take out contractions from it's to it is and also to clarify meaning by uh, adding or substituting more specific content like in the example we just saw. And in her Japanese essay, most of the uh, repair was actually adding hedging, for example, changing a statement to a question to make it softer. Okay, moving on to uh, the second. Original ways of reshaping learned text features. This is also called adaptive transfer or dynamic transfer of learning um, in the literature. And I have two examples. One is Kenji's original approach. He combined journalistic and academic writing. So this is a, a diagram of the text features in his three essays. So in uh, all three essays, he used ex exploration two, which is actually putting the position at the beginning, but then uh, showing the, the process of thinking about it, not listing reasons, but uh, more of a flow of ideas about it, exploring it in his development, going back and forth between concrete and abstract. He also used a lot of personal examples, and he focused on extending his ideas, being original. And this is... Um, my notes that I can't see, <laughs> I had written out what he said about the elderly living with family, um, but since there isn't time anyway, since we, have, we started late, I probably, it's okay. But basically, his, he was in favor of elderly living with family, but he had his own original theme. He started with something to do with um, uh, dying, uh, elderly people dying, so he was he's actually looking at it from a different perspective. And he ended up with his own idea of what happiness is, not living with money, but um, living with family surrounding you. So he, he had a very original way of approaching this, uh, which was more like journalistic writing. And in and, and French, it was similar. And then in English, uh, studying abroad, he um, gave his own personal experience. Uh, and he was saying that uh, he thought that French, he gave the example, he thought French people all like to drink wine, but he discovered they actually like to drink beer and cocktails. And this was a small example, but something that overturned his stereotypes by actually, you know, going overseas. So he was uh, supporting the idea of studying abroad. So for Kenji, the most influential factor was actually his journalistic background. He had been a student correspondent. When he was in France, he sent articles back to a local newspaper, and he actually had them published, quite a few articles published. And a couple, I think a year before that, he'd been in Puerto Rico as an intern, and he had done the same. So he had a lot of journalistic experience, and he was actually job hunting at the time we did the study to become a journalist, and he got offers from some really good places. Um, so he really had his own principle. He, he wanted to express his writer identity. He was seeking depth, a unique perspective, and insight. He didn't want to do ordinary writing. And he had no predetermined outline. He followed what we call a what next strategy as he was writing. And he felt that the, putting the position at the beginning was like having a headline in, in an article to inform the, the reader of what was going on, like a newspaper article. Okay, our other original approach is Sakura. And she 
actually made the most amazingly complex argument structures, uh, as which I'll show you in a minute, in both English and Japanese. And that's, this required a lot of global planning. So unlike the earlier one with the position, reasons, and so on, these are justification. But uh, as you can see in the Japanese, she was against elderly living with family. But instead of giving supporting reasons, she started with a reason uh, for living with family. So against her position, for living with family. And then she refuted that by uh, giving her supporting reasons for not living together. It's very complicated. I, I don't, I'm not going to show you a version of it. But basically, the two paragraphs were long developed paragraphs. They both started with a, a counter argument reason. They both refuted it by first giving indirect and then giving direct. So by indirect, we mean the weak points of the other side. By direct, the strong points of my side. So basically, it was, it was fairly complex. The English was a little bit different, but it was also complex. She first started out by giving the two counter argument reasons against study abroad. And I think it was, uh, you can use the internet and you can meet foreigners. Uh, so those are two reasons that you don't really need to go study abroad. Uh, but the rest of the essay, she refuted those reasons. And she, again, very, very, uh, she had three reasons. And there were, the, each paragraph was organized with direct and then indirect. So uh, the first one, for example, I think was you're immersed in the language 24 hours a day. And uh, this means you have to use the language to survive. Uh, you can learn it, the indirect, uh, if, you're, if you stay home, uh, you, you really don't have the same need to use it. So you don't acquire it as quickly. Uh, anyway, she gave the, I don't remember exactly how she uh, uh, supported that, but in the second one, it was skills, four skills. You could learn the four skills if you go overseas, but if you stay home, you only learn to read and write. So each one of the paragraphs was uh, parallel. So this required a lot of global planning. This shows uh, global versus local level planning for um, three of the uh, writers. I didn't have room to put four, but it's the same pattern. Anyway, uh, she was the only one who used so much global planning as she was going. And basically, she used it um, both at the beginning of the paragraph and inside the paragraph, she'd go back to her plans. And she'd be thinking about that paragraph and the following paragraph. So she really was thinking very carefully about the structure. Um, and she said that at the pre-writing stage, she didn't plan the exact structure. She planned the content. So that means that while she was uh, writing, she had to make those connections. And she decided what to focus on for the current and the following one. So it was pretty amazing, actually. She's the only one who did this. And for her, uh, her the biggest factor in her life, I think, was her father. As she was growing up, her father was a teacher, high school teacher. And anytime she wanted something, he would make her justify that logically. She'd have to give a logical argument why she's going to get her new whatever she wanted. And that really stuck with her. And she had debate training also in high school, Japanese. And she had a really positive attitude toward discussion and debate. And she often had discussions with foreign students. She took uh, debating classes with foreign students and Japanese students. And, and she really enjoyed uh, so, and had a lot of experience building up arguments. And so she was able to do this sophisticated way of integrating the counter argument and refutation um, in both English and Japanese because she was so fluent in English. Uh, her French was not so complex. It was, it was good, but it was, it was no, nowhere near as, as complex as this. OK, we're to the third. Uh, I don't have a clock, but anyway, we're probably OK, because they're shorter now. So the third is the greater awareness of difference reader expectations across languages. I guess I do have a clock. Yeah, we're getting close. Um, I have only one example of this, but it's one I hope you'll enjoy. 
Ryoko used a more emphatic style in Korean and in English than she did in Japanese, where she was more cautious. And this shows the number of boosters she used in Japanese, Korean, and English, and hedges. So we can see in Japanese she only had two boosters, and um, wow, the Korean looks okay, right? <laughs> on this slide, I hope. Uh, anyway, the, these are examples of the Korean boosters. She used a lot of Korean boosters and not so many hedges. These are examples of the boosters. I'm sorry, I apologize if this is not good Korean. We got a lot of help from one foreign student gave us the most help. Um, but anyway, uh, English boosters, uh, those were the ones that, that she used. And her perspective was the reason, her perception of uh, Japanese, uh, sorry, Korean and English uh, readers ex uh, expect cl direct, clear ideas. So in English, she learned, she learned this about English when she was studying how to write an English short essay for her entrance exam. She learned to be direct, like starting a paragraph with a topic sentence. And then in Korean, uh, she, she felt when she was studying Korea that Korean people were straightforward when she, she interacted with local people. So her perception was that Korean readers would like uh, more direct than Japanese. And in Japanese, she really did uh, do a lot more hedging. And interestingly, more evidence for this is we asked her to translate her Korean essay into Japanese. And when she did it, she took out one of the boosters unconsciously, and she added a hedge in Japanese unconsciously. Uh, so it, it shows that she really did perceive that Japanese should be softer. Okay, and the last one is strategic use of different languages in the composing processes. And uh, I have three examples of this. The first is Ryoko's use of Japanese while composing in the other two languages. So for the L2 essays, this is Ryoko on the right, Kenji, Chie, Sakura. So this shows what percentage of their acti activities were in Japanese, in the red, or in mixed language, where they were, they're mixing uh, both Japanese and some other language. And we can see that, that Ryoko's is off the chart. She used a lot of Japanese. And same thing for the L3 essay. In this case, it was, uh, for her, it was English. Um, the reason is uh, she used Japanese for planning, either all in Japanese, or she would uh, mix Japanese and the target language, but mostly Japanese with a few target language words stuck in. And then rehearsing uh, in Japanese, and then translating, as we saw in the earlier example. Evaluating, almost all the writers use Japanese to evaluate, you know, oh, this doesn't sound right, or something like that. And then she even did rereading in Japanese. So she'd written something in English and she read it back to herself in Japanese to, to confirm. And that was unusual, the back translation. Um, basically, then we can see from her case that multilingual writers can make use of their L1 either directly or through translation or by mixing it, um, usually to direct their own self-action. We'll see an example of that in a minute right here. So this is Sakura's, uh, sorry, I went too fast by there. She used English while she was composing in Japanese, uh, in French, sorry. English is her second language, French her third language. So she's the only one who's, who used like 20% of her activities were actually used, used English when she was writing in French. Remember, she's fairly fluent in English. So this is an example. So the top line is uh, planning in Japanese. Then she rehearsed a sentence in English. If we had the budget, we should spend it in a different way. Then she trans started translating the sentence little by little, l'autre façon, another way. And then she wrote part of it, si on a la bouge, cette nouvelle pro, and then rehearsing in English again, we should, we should, and translating it. Uh, un to de pense. So she mixed a uh, little bit of hesitation marker in Japanese with French and then translated it and, and wrote. So this is an, oh, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Five minutes. Good. Great. Perfect. Okay. And this is an uh, example of Kenji's word searching. Uh, he was looking for the English word opportunity 
And this is what he said. Occasion, occasion ka kikai opportunity. Uh, eto kikai, 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 kikai uh, chance, uh, chance ka opportunity nishoka. So it's very mixed up. So he was able to use uh, his Japanese to kind of direct himself, but he also used his, his French to help him find the English word. So we can see that uh, there are two main advantages for multilingual writers to um, uh, use their multiple languages. One is to expand their vocabulary further by translating and borrowing. And the second is, <laughs> that was a two on my slide, <laughs> there's a one there. ability to use L1 or, or the mixed language to direct uh, yourself in your search. So they're tools. So conclusions. Basically, um, writers have the, seem to have their own signature or style across languages, even languages they don't know very well. Um, it's closely related to their history, instruction, experience, and their perceptions and beliefs. One practical pedagogical implication as, as writing teachers might be that there is possibly a developmental sequence for constructing, to learning to construct arguments. First, you learn to list supporting reasons. Then maybe you learn to ex expand the reasons more. And then you add a counter-argument refutation in a separate paragraph, because it's, it's optional to put. And then, like Sakura, maybe you can eventually learn to in integrate or interrelate the uh, counter-argument with it. But that's pretty complex. That's pretty advanced. General pedagogical application is that we can take advantage of students' other, other languages and not limit uh, to English only. Uh, try some translanguaging practices, that is, allow some multiple language use in the classroom and promote translingualism, which is defined as the ability of multilingual writers to shuttle between languages, treating the diverse languages that they form as their repertoire as an integrated system without borders. Uh, so these are the basic conclusions. The writer empowerment uh, is the shared merged knowledge. And even limited language proficiency writers can write coherent text if they take advantage of what they know uh, about writing in other languages. And then the expanded resources for language use, um, we can use L1 and L2, other languages in the composing process. And the more language resources that people acquire, the more they can develop soft boundaries between languages. So final thoughts, with more experience, we can exert more control over our text by choosing the most appropriate features to fit particular audiences. And again, knowledge is not enough, as we know. It has to be internalized through extensive, repeated use and practice. And there's no end point to our growth as writers. Our development continues as long as we keep writing. And this is based on our study of professional writers, five of them, uh, uh, that really, even after 20 years of publishing academic papers, professional writers are still growing and learning how to, how to, how to do it better. So, okay, that's all. Thank you.